Today, I get to talk to Bill Bryant. He's a Republican. He's running for the uh, governor's position here in the state of Washington. He's 54 years old. He announced in mid-May this might be your opportunity to... Um, oh, he's 55, he tells me. Wow, got to add one to that. Okay. Uh, he announced in mid-May uh, he is currently uh, Port of Seattle Commissioner. We have a lot of ports here, so I think people are fairly familiar, uh, familiar with some of that. All right, Bill, what's interesting here is that you're already starting a year out on this process, more than a year out. You know, the GOP, this is not new news to you, has lost the last eight governor races in the state of Washington, going back to 1984. Wow. It's a long way it's back there. It's a long there. time. Long time. Um, actually, I understand it is the longest losing streak in the nation it for is. the party. Oh, wow. Not something we can be proud of, no. but yes, it is. All right, so knowing all that, why do you want to be governor of the state of Washington? Well, why I want to be governor is different than what I want to do. And the why really comes from uh, a person who shaped my life named Father Davis, Roy Davis, who was a Jesuit priest who I met when I was back at school and who kept in touch with me after graduating. Um, we even uh, vacationed together. He married Barbara and me, and, and the three of us were very good friends. He came out uh, 10 years ago, right before he died, his last trip out. We were up in the Okanagan. And one of the very last things he said to me was, Bill, at the end of your life, all the stuff you've been able to buy won't matter. He said, at the end of your days, all that's going to matter are the lives you've touched and the community you've built. And so when my company got to the point where I didn't have to be there every day, in 2007 I ran for a King County position uh, at the Port of Seattle. And I'm looking right now at our state after having been elected twice in King County and realizing we have a governor who's not building community, who's really driving people apart and is touching lives in a way that I don't think they need to be touched. We need to be elevating people that I think are being held back. And so I've decided to step in and run for governor. All right. What do you think the biggest issue is facing the state of Washington? Uh, easily, the biggest issue is education. And I think it's uh, both a moral and an economic problem. Uh, morally, we have a state where 25% of our ninth graders will not graduate from high school, and we accept that. 25%? 25%. Okay. And populations of color or are folks that come from less advantaged communities, it's less than 25, or it's more than 25%. Mm -hmm. In some communities, 50% of the students will not graduate from high school. What I think is even more damning, though, is that uh, in the last few years, over 55% of the high school graduates who went to enroll in classes at community college did not have the skills they needed to begin taking community college classes, even though they had a high school degree. Mm -hmm. That's morally wrong. We're, we're, letting, we're failing these kids. And it's not only a moral problem, it's the fact that we're failing these kids and we're resigning them to a different life than they should be able to have, but it's undermining our economy. Over at the Port of Seattle, um, I was talking to one of the labor leaders several months ago, and he said, Bill, we have these jobs in refrigeration technology, um, engineering. They're, they're the folks who work on reefers, the refrigerated containers. Mm -hmm. And these are the containers we put you know, apples and seafood into and frozen fries. And we want to make sure that the seafood and the frozen fries stay frozen. We want the apples just chilled. So you've got to have the skills to program them. He said, this is not a four-year degree. It takes an 18-month certificate. The jobs pay between five and six thousand, seven thousand a month. They're going wanting because we cannot find high school students with the math or the computer science skills. So clearly, if we want to keep good employers in Washington State, we need to fix our education system. So what's the greatest focus on your part? Looking at how we teach children or the money issue or teacher qualification? What's what's how do they shake out? Um, I think that the money issue is one of equity, and that we have, over the last 30 years, uh, created a system where the quality of education you get depends entirely on whether or not you come from a wealthy school district or not. Mm -hmm. And if you come from a school district where the uh, parents are able to have special fundraisers and they can pass levies, then you're going to have special science labs and technology courses and special counseling. But if you don't, then you're not going to get the same education. I grew up in a very rural community over on the Olympic Peninsula. Dad was a teacher in the Hood Canal School District, and I went. To, he taught on the Skokomish Reservation, and that's where I went to school. 
And it was at a time when we funded basic education equally across Washington State. So I got a very good public education. But today, a lot of kids in some of those communities are not getting the education. So the equity of money. But it's not just a function of pouring more money into the system, because the system's broken. When we're leaving 25% of our kids behind, that's a broken system. And pouring more gas into a broken car is not going to get us where we need to be. So we need to begin reforming our education system so that it meets the needs of kids in the 21st century. And you feel that the legislature is not currently attacking that? I think the legislature made a good uh, step forward in increasing the level of funding that they are providing K-12 education. And I think that they are trying to figure out a solution to the equity issue, and that's going to be before them in this next session. And the court's going to insist that it be before them in the next session. But I also see us taking huge steps backwards. The Supreme Court and the governor have uh, just decided that they want to eliminate charter schools in Washington State. I was in Seattle and toured one of the charter schools in the International District that is meeting the needs of kids whose needs were not being met in a regular school system. And I'm going to be touring two schools tomorrow in Spokane. And these are schools that are really actually meeting the needs of kids who don't necessarily fit in in the other uh, programs. Why would, we, why would we abandon something that's working in so many other states? We have an a, uh, entrenched interest group here that wants to tie us to a 1950s school system. And it's not meeting the needs of kids today. Yeah, a lot of people are scratching their heads on that one, that's for sure. Before we go too much further, I, um, I think some people who may not be that familiar with you, Bill, may think that you are a West Sider uh, because you are representing now the Port of Seattle. But what is your connection to Eastern Washington? Well, it's pretty broad and deep. I mean, I was born in Morton, which is just on the other side of the White Pass Highway, or Freeway, or mm -hmm. Highway Pass. Um, but I didn't really grow up in Morton. I grew up, as I said, over in Hoodsport on the Olympic Peninsula, but my parents were from Mossy Rock, Packwood, Randall, Morton area, and so I was always spending my summers down in Lewis County. Um, after college, though, I was hired by the Apple industry to do the international trade negotiations and open up export markets for our apple, pear, and cherry growers around the world. And so I lived in Yakima in the 80s and early 90s, and uh, in 1992, my wife Barbara and I moved over to Seattle to set up my company. My company does international trade work and helps farmers export their crops. So I continue to work with folks in the potato industry, fresh and processed, in the wine industry, uh, the tree fruit industry, hops. And so even though Barbara and I moved over to the coast in 92, my company, the business, is still in central Washington. So I'm on both sides of the pass all the time. And a lot of that product is going through the port of Seattle. <laughs> a lot of that product is going through the port yeah. of Seattle. I have been, uh, I've been called the commissioner from central and eastern Washington because one of the reasons I ran for a seat on the commission was to ensure that the agricultural interests were being represented at the port of Seattle. Mm -hmm. All right, well, in my dealings with a lot of folks, small businesses, sitting on boards, that kind of thing, you know, one of the issues that it constantly repeated is unnecessary regulations. And yet it... Uh, I just don't see our state doing anything about it. What's your take on that? Well, it's another reason that I think we need new leadership after 30 years. Uh, because over the last 30 years, we've piled on a huge amount of new regulation on business. I, mean, I, I run a small company. We have 35 employees. And I fully understand how difficult it is to constantly be keeping up with all of the new regulations that are being dumped upon us. Uh, no one's really stepped back and looked at the accumulative effect of all of these regulations on business and the stifling effect that it can have on starting a new company. And I think one of the very first things that I want to do as governor is to have a full review of all of the programs and regulations that we have in place and figure out what the objective was of that program or regulation. And let's evaluate whether or not we're meeting that objective. And if we're not, then we either figure out whether the objective is one we should try and meet and come up with a different program or regulation, or we get rid of it. We need a wholesale review. We need to clean house. And that sort of critical review hasn't occurred in 30 years, and it's about time it does. And can you promise today that you would include some small business people on that review panel? Oh, of course. 
mean, well, I know that seems like a of course, yeah, but it's an of hasn't course. Well, as, yet. A, as someone who runs a company with 35 <laughs> employees, you bet I'm going to be looking after the folks who do the same. All right. Okay, we want to take a break right here, but we'll be back. We want to invite you to call. Maybe you've got a question, a comment you want to offer to Bill Bryant. The phone number is 547-8726. We are back in just a moment. Stay with us. October 1st, my guest today is Bill Bryant, Republican, running for governor of the state of Washington. Uh, Bill, taxation is always, always a big issue in any kind of a major election like this. Are you running on a no new taxes platform, which would be typical for a Republican? Well, I can tell you that as I move around the state, and I'm moving around the state a lot, there is no appetite for new taxes at all. And what we saw from the governor this last session is promoting a number of new taxes, even though we had more revenue than we have had in years. And we even had more revenue than we were anticipating having. And yet he still wanted to have some new taxes just for the sake of having them. That's wrong. We don't need to be dumping any more tax burden on the middle class, and that's what apparently he's intent on doing. I got to tell you, one of the reasons why I ran for the uh, King County Seattle Pork Commission is that when I ran eight years ago, the commission was raising the taxes to the maximum amount they could every year, whether they needed to or not. And after I was elected, with 50% in bits and pieces, I'm one of two Republicans elected in King County, uh, after I was elected, since I run a company, the other commissioner said, well, Bill, why don't you work with the staff this year on the budget? And I began working with the staff on a budget, and uh, then the next year I was elected president, so I had about even more control. And I started saying, you know, we have some non-performing assets here that we're tethering to these, these assets that are actually doing well. If we separated them, and if we got rid of some of these programs that might have been useful at one time but don't seem to be doing that much anymore, I think we can put together a budget that cut taxes. And we did. Mm -hmm. And every year since, we have either cut taxes in real terms or held them flat. That sort of zero-based budgeting and critical analysis needs to occur at the state level before we even think about having any new taxes. Well, what that means, though, is a redistribution of what that tax revenue is. So some programs, uh, you know, lose out in that. Uh, have you identified any that you think would probably lose out in a review? No, I haven't. I think you have to do that review. I know that whenever, when I was running for the port, I could not have imagined the review that I went through after I was in there. You need to be able to look at that budget, identify what the priorities are, identify whether those programs are filling out those priorities and meeting the objectives, and then you can determine whether or not they need to be continued. And I think that review is what we have been lacking over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I think as citizens we've heard these things before every time someone runs and they just don't seem to get implemented and that really is a frustration to folks. I totally agree uh, and that's why perhaps uh, we need to elect somebody who's already done it once they've been elected and I demonstrated at the Port of Seattle that's exactly what I've done. Okay. Every state is but, but involved. You know what? I think yeah, it's what? because I think most of these people who run for office have been running for office their whole career. Yes. And having somebody who's actually, you know, not it's not a career politician, but I've built a company here in central Washington that employs, you know, three dozen people. Having that background in the private sector gives me a totally different perspective and approach to government and has made me a much better official in the public sector. Well, and part of it, too, is because when you're hanging out there in the private sector, it's all up to you. You either make it work or you don't. Mm -hmm. When you're an elected official, you can be the most incompetent person on the planet, you're still going to get your paycheck. See, it's a different yeah, standard. Yeah, that's, that's frightening. Well, totally. And I can't, if I, my company budget, budget public. But, but people keep uh, keep electing those know-nothings, so well, that's extremely <laughs> disappointing. Well, no, I we, would I would challenge that, because should. there are some know-nothings right uh, now. But anyway. But I'll tell you, though, I, if I, in my company budget, I don't have the luxury of keeping programs around or doing something that's not returning a profit. Yeah. I have to be scrutinizing that budget to make sure that we're doing what is going to accomplish our objectives for the year. And we should hold government to that same standard. Most people, I think, would agree with that. <clears throat> I want to talk about job creation because I know it's another issue that's important to you. States are competing for that. Every state, obviously, wants to bring more business, more jobs to their area. What can we do in the state of Washington that the governor can have an impact on or you know, can stimulate here in this state to get more jobs, better jobs? First of all, I want to emphasize that government doesn't create jobs, yeah. except government jobs. But I've learned at the Port of Seattle, government can put the infrastructure into place that allows jobs to be created. 
And so there are four things that I would like to focus on during the first term in order to generate more really solid middle class jobs. The first is we've got to make sure that electrical power here is as cheap as it possibly can be or is inexpensive. We need to ensure that anything that requires a great deal of energy for its manufacture is manufactured in Washington State. Whether that's steel over on the coast or whether it's carbon fiber in Moses Lake. Products that require a lot of power need to be built here. And right now we have a governor who's actually trying to drive up the costs on those companies and drive jobs out of Washington State. I want to ensure that we have a solid hydro-based manufacturing sector and we could do more to bring those middle class jobs to Washington. The second is we need a, a long-term sustainable water retention program for central Washington. And that's not something I just talk about when I'm on this side of the pass. I talk about it over on the coast as well. Because people on the coast need to understand that a lot of jobs over there depend upon a solid agricultural economy in central Washington. I was down at the Longview a few months ago, at the Port of Longview, and they were showing me all of the agricultural equipment and inputs that they bring in through the Port of Longview. And they said, Bill, do you want to see where these go? And I said, yeah. And they hit a little button, and it showed that they all come to here and Moses Lake. Mm. And then from there, they get distributed throughout central Washington. They produce food, which then gets re-exported through the Port of Seattle around the world. There's a circular job-generating engine going on there, but it requires us to have a long-term water program for central Washington. The third thing, which I do talk about more on the coast than over here, but it's important, is that over the next 10 years, the entire North Pacific fishing fleet has got to be rebuilt. These are our grandfather's vessels, and, and they just are not meeting current safety, environmental, or efficiency standards. The new vessels cost tens of millions of dollars each. They look like the Starship Enterprise. Many states are competing to rebuild the fleet in their states, but particularly down in the Gulf. I want them built here in Washington State. But when I talk to folks in the industry about what's the biggest inhibitor to having them built in Washington State, do you know what they say? No. We don't have the workforce we need. We don't have kids who are mm. trained to build these new vessels. That goes back to the education discussion we were just having. And then the fourth area that I think we need to focus on is tourism. Washington is 50 out of 50 states in promoting tourism, despite the fact that we have all of these great assets from national parks to, to uh, wonderful um, facilities all across Washington that could be attracting tourists. But we don't, we don't promote it. Tourism is the fourth largest employer in Washington state, and most of those employees are in small companies. But the state is not doing anything to reinforce those businesses, and I think we should be. Well, as consumers, we certainly see the competition of that on, for example, TV and commercials. Some states have taken a very, very aggressive stance in promoting their state, and Washington has substantially cut their money. If you're in Seattle, countries. Montana has you know bus posters all yeah. over the place, but they know that for every dollar they spend, they're going to get about seven or eight dollars back. And during some national sports broadcasts, you'll see in other channels. I've seen ads for Michigan, Texas. I think it's some other ones, but yeah, they will buy national advertising. When the legislature yeah. abandoned the tourism promotion yes. um, uh, program and we became 50 out of 50 states, the Port of Seattle stepped up. We had to because we have international flights going from Seattle to all over the world and from other parts of the world to Seattle, and we did need to make sure that those flights are full. So we've been working in all of the capitals where we have direct flights, whether it's Paris or Frankfurt or Shanghai and Tokyo to make sure that people want to come to Washington State. Um, with that, but the port can't fill in the gap that the, that the uh, state used to fill, and we need to step up and really provide more of a support system. It's, it's interesting, when I was over in Europe one time talking to people with the Air France about what the French want to do, they said their first trip to the United States is two cities. You want to guess what they are for their first trip? First trip? First I, trip. I, I was going to say New York. New or York and Orlando. That's where they come the Orlando. first time. Orlando. Oh, okay. They, All right. Okay, so that's, yeah. that's their view of the United States, is mm -hmm. New York and Orlando. Um, but they said their second trip, they want to go west, and they want to go to national parks, and they want to go to communities that have bakeries or breweries or, or wineries. And I said, well, that's Washington State. We've got national parks, and we've got bakeries and breweries and wineries. But they said, yeah, but if you go on the uh, Internet and you Google Washington, you're just going to get a bunch of stuff about Washington, D.C. Washington yes. State is invisible. We need to turn that around. Okay, here's one other question that I can't 
go through this interview, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk with you at other times during the next year. Whenever you want sure. me to drop by, yeah. I'm happy to drop by. Uh, a very, um, a, an issue that really divides people, and it still does today, and this has been going on for 20 years, and that is pro-life, pro-choice. And uh, it's my personal opinion that um, uh, the reason that uh, Republican has not moved into the governor's mansion in the state of Washington in the past three or four elections is because of that issue. How will you approach that issue? Uh, that's a great question. And it's a question that I get wherever I go in Washington state. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's clearly an issue that people on both sides feel very passionately about. And for, for both sides, it's a, very, it's a matter of principle and, and morals and, and ethics, and that's why I think it, it's, it's very complicated to deal with in, in the public sector. So I'll just tell you what, what I think. Um, and when I was in high school, I lived in Brazil uh, for over a year, about around a year, and uh, that was when Brazil was ruled by a military dictatorship, and it really controlled what people could and couldn't do in some senses. And then in the early 80s, before I moved to Yakima, I was uh, in China for four months when China was very much an oppressive totalitarian regime. And the Chinese government uh, insinuated itself into your life in, in all matters. I mean, to who you will marry and who you would live and whether you could or could not have children. And so those two experiences of living under a very oppressive government affected me. And while I am Catholic, and I struggle to be a good Catholic. I just, I just know that any government that can force my religion on somebody else is a government that can force somebody else's religion on me. And so while I have uh, values that I hold very dear when it comes to life, I do not want to impose those on other people. Okay, all right. Um, tell me who has endorsed you so far that they are people that folks in Eastern Washington would recognize. Well, most recently, Sid Morrison, who was our congressman yes. here for uh -huh. years and years. Yes. Uh, Sid uh, stepped up and issued a very nice statement encouraging people to support me, and I, I really appreciate that. I worked with Sid for a long time when he was in Congress and, and really welcomed that endorsement. Um, Slate Gorton last week, who is a former U.S. Senator, has endorsed me. Dan Evans has endorsed me. Um, almost all members of the state Republican House caucus have endorsed me. Uh, so it's, it's a broad swath. I, I think next uh, week you're going to see that the port commissioners from all over the state, including many right here, um, are on board, as are many county commissioners from Benton, Franklin, and Yakima counties. So it's a, a broad uh, group of people who want to see us move forward in November of 16. All right. I've got one more question because I don't want to let you go until we talk about this one other thing, and that is the, the combative nature between East and West state of Washington and the divide between the Cascades. I mean, uh, it, folks in, in Eastern Washington often feel that they are left out. Uh, you know, they're landmass, they're not people numbers, and um, so sometimes they feel like their voice uh, does not get heard. Well, I, I know that from when I lived in Yakima. We used to say it doesn't really matter whether we vote or not because King County is going to decide the election. And uh, when I moved to King County, I realized, you know, that's not true. Um, I've, I've been elected twice in King County, and I run in three congressional districts. That's my district. is 16 legislative districts, three congressional districts. The King County is one-third of the registered voters in Washington State. But that means two-thirds of the voters are outside King County. The difference is people in King County, particularly voters in Seattle, vote. Over 80% of them vote. If Benton and Franklin counties had voted in the same percentage as King County, Dino would have been elected governor well out of recount territory. Mm -hmm. If Yakima, Benton, and Franklin counties had voted in the same percentage as the Seattle legislative districts voted, I don't know, Rob, it would have been pretty darn close and Rob might have been over the top. So we just need to let people know that, you know what, our votes over here in central Washington do matter. And every time you don't vote, you're actually giving two votes to somebody in King County. All right. Thanks, Bill Bryant. I really enjoyed meeting you for the first time today, and I hope other people had a chance to hear what you have to say. A lot will be said over the next year about the governor's race. Thanks much. Appreciate Thank you so much. I'll come back anytime. All right. We'll be back in just a moment here on Meet in the Middle.